There we go. So, as you can see, we have a midterm on Tuesday. So, there is a very helpful thing called my exams link, which has my midterm and solutions from last spring. And can you read that? There we go. So it has things that I think are important and which people botched last time, which was an inability to add hexadecimal numbers. Make sure you know how to do that. Another common question that was missed last time, which we'll be going over today, is how to do bit shifting and bitwise exclusive OR, which are operations you should have learned in CS130, in which we will again be going over today. So, just a second. So, make sure that you know these things and that you go over the sample exam. Here's another one. You need to know this trick that was in Dr. Plank's notes about how you can add integers to chars. Why can you add an integer to a char like that? Because it's an ASCII code. So what do you think gets printed out? Nope, 40. So it might be accurate if I had asked it to be printed at. You have to look at the printout. So you would be potentially right if it was an integer, but I don't expect you to know the ASCII code. So I print it as a character. Or it'd be the seventh letter of the alphabet, which is A, B, C, D, E, F, yes, G. <laughs> it's the seventh letter of the alphabet, which is G, is what would get printed out. So you need to know about that. You could do subtraction, too. If I had G minus 6, it would print out A. Or I could have said int value equals G minus A, and you would print out. If I said, so let's say that instead on the test, I said int, that very good. So if I'd said G minus A, and then I said print F percent D value, you would answer 6 because whatever the ASCII code is for G minus whatever the ASCII code is for A, it's a difference of 6. I don't expect you to know what the ASCII codes are. I don't know what the ASCII codes are. I have to look them up all the time. But the important thing is that they're numbered consecutively. So for integers, the ASCII codes are consecutive, starting at 0. For capital letters, the ASCII codes are consecutive starting at capital A. And for lowercase characters, the ASCII codes are consecutive starting at lowercase a. So you can do these addition and subtraction operations with confidence. That's what I do expect you to know. OK. So if you're wondering what might I ask in your paper exam, for, so last time, I asked the entire first midterm on paper. And then I figured out that it was much better to ask the programming questions in lab where you could type them in and test them. And I could read your beautiful typewritten handwriting rather than, sorry to say it, many of your illegible um, handwriting. Now, some of you have beautiful handwriting. I, for those of you who do, I don't mean to impugn you. But many of you write no better than doctors, and it is a strain. But if you type it in, it looks beautiful. So the first, let's see, four, five. So the first five. Questions 1 through 5 and so questions 1 through 5 and 10 would be paper based. <coughs> and most likely 6 
through 9 would be on code assessor on Wednesday. So that's the other important thing, is that your midterm is actually both on Tuesday and on Wednesday in lab. So on Tuesday, you will do the paper-based portion, which is more about reading code and being able to answer questions such as, why do you pass objects by reference rather than by value, which is what is the answer to that? Why do you pass a object by reference rather than by value? Okay, one reason, regardless, okay, so let me add to that, regardless of whether you plan to change its value or not. I think I heard it, but you don't have to create a copy of it every time. So. Objects can be expensive to copy. And so regardless of whether you plan to change an object or not, you pass it by reference because you don't want to have to copy it. And the reason you don't want to have, so I typically want you in your explanation to go just beyond because you don't have to copy it. I want to know why because copying large objects like vectors can slow your program down. So it's not enough. So I think it's one of these questions actually asked that. There we go. It was question two. It says in a function, why should you use reference parameters for objects rather than value parameters? Okay, and if you look at my answer, is because I say because that is expensive. I don't just say because you don't want to make copies. You need to tell me why you don't want to make copies. You need to show me that you understand what the reason is. It's expensive because really if you have a very large object it's going to have to copy a lot of memory. Copying memory is expensive and it will slow down your program considerably. So actually what I put in blue is the best answer you could really give but I would have taken answer two. But if you just gave me this part of it, you would not get full credit because you haven't shown me that you understand why you pass objects by reference. Yes, you don't want to make copies, but why is that important? It's because copies are expensive, and actually even there that's not perfect. It's expensive because copying memory is expensive and it will slow down your program. So you need to give me complete explanations. Okay? Now, so, remember, midterm in class on Tuesday, coding portion of the midterm on next Wednesday. For the coding portion, you may bring in a one-page cheat sheet, front and back. You may not do that for the paper exam. So it would be very helpful to have examples of things like printf and cn and how you declare functions and vectors because you'll be expected to do that on the coding portion and I expect you to get your syntax correct. Okay, you'll be allowed to compile it You'll be allowed to test it against test cases, so I expect you to get the syntax correct. So your one-page cheat sheet should probably have examples of programs on it. Because then you can refer to those examples and see how things are declared, like how is a vector declared? Or if I ask for a type def, how does a type def work? Okay. I also, on Piazza, if you noticed, I guaranteed a question on separate compilation. So when I write things on Piazza, like I guarantee there will be a question 
on separate compilation, you should take me at my word and study separate compilation and know, for example, how to separately compile files. Okay, so questions about any of this. You'll have an hour. The first hour of lab on Wednesday will be the exam. The second hour will have to decide be either top coder or will be just working on your lab, probably giving you the chance to work on your lab. So there'll probably be no top coder next Wednesday. So the first hour will be your exam. Second hour, you'll get to work on your lab. Okay. And finally, I know I've said it before, but I'll say it again. The paper version covers everything up to today. So all of hashing. The coding part will cover everything up through classes from last Thursday, so will not include hashing. So the paper version on Tuesday will include hashing, guaranteed, but the coding part will not include hashing. Okay? Okay. So, today we're going to finish up with hashing, and fortunately we have back our um, internet connection today. So, if you remember, what we're trying to do with a hash table is we have three operations that we want to efficiently implement. What were those three operations? Find, insert, and delete. Thank you. Okay, and remember that with a hash table, the basic idea is you have a vector or array. So for the most part, we'll work with vectors. And we have a hash function, which we'll either call h or hash, which takes what we call a key. So the key is what we're storing. And it's going to give us a value between 0 and table size minus 1. So it's supposed to give us a random value between 0 and table size minus 1. That's where we will typically store the value. What was the one glitch with this strategy? What can happen when we go to insert a key into the hash table? You got it. Collisions. There could already be a key stored there. For example, here we have Luther, Binky, and Rosalita already in this file. Suppose we want to insert Brad, and let's say that hash of Brad ends up being equal to 2. The problem is Binky beat me into location 2, and so we need to have a strategy for resolving this. So last time we talked about two separate strategies, one we called separate chaining, and one we called linear probing. So, man in green, what's your name? Yeah. Nat. What was separate chaining? Do you remember what separate chaining did? What do you mean between? Okay, tell me about linear probing. Um, it'll store like, I mean, it'll store a list of like the entries you put Brad, mm -hmm. you would go to two, and then Brinky would put you to one. Okay, so which place is it going to put Brad? In two. So, but I can't put it in two because it's full, so. Okay, that's okay. 
behind you. What's your name? Gus. Gus. Either one. I'm pretty sure your linear probing is you like put it in, like you check four, and if that's full, then it would go over to the next one to see if that's empty, and if it is, then you look to see if it's empty. Very good. So linear probing puts it in the next, puts it in the next, in the next free. or in the next free, I'm going to call it bucket. You're going to hear me, this is how I was taught to think of it as buckets. So you'll hear me call it bucket. Um, next free, another thing is free entry. But in case I get into the habit of calling it buckets, it's just how I was taught. But bucket is really the next free entry in the vector. So that means, Gus, which entry would it be put in? Brad, if it hashed to two. You put it in three. Good. Okay, and now to make it a little more interesting, Gus, I'm going to keep the spotlight on you. Let's say Nels is here in nine, and let's say that I want to insert Smiley, and Smiley hashes to nine. Where am I going to put Smiley? Because next available, it looks like I'm at the end of the vector. Okay, that's a good guess, but we're going to go to zero. So going up and we wrap around. So if we're at the end and we don't find something, we wrap around to the beginning. Okay, so we'd actually put it here. There is a technique of going either before or after, which turns out to be more efficient but too complicated for this class. So that is another collision resolution strategy, is to look both to the left and the right. And it's more efficient, but we won't be doing it. <laughs> okay, so we'll just, and how, let's see, um, your name is? Ashley. Ashley. So Ashley, how could I do the wraparound? Like if I, um, so I'm using i, and I increment i, and i becomes 10. What's the magic trick that I could use to wrap that around to 0? Okay, so that's one way. So I could just say if i equal equal table size, i equals zero. Perfectly fine. Okay, there is a slightly simpler way. That would be close, but mod mod it. So the simpler way, because then you don't have that. The reason this is simpler is you don't have to have the if statement. Okay, either way is fine, but this is just a little, it's an idiom to get used to because I know I didn't write it too clearly. So it would normally be I plus plus, and then you'd mod it with the table size because that way you never have to worry about resetting I. It's kind of like subtracting table size without having to do it. Okay, so it's just a good trick. It's a trick. Just put it in your toolkit. Okay, so that's linear probing. You all got the harder approach, actually, first. Separate chaining works in a different way. So who, if anyone, remembers separate chaining? Yes. Yes. So each entry is actually a vector. So this would not, this and this is not how it looks like. This is linear probing. Let's see if we have a picture for separate chaining. Sadly, we do not. OK. So with separate chaining, Each of our entries is actually a vector. And what we do is we're just pushing new items onto the vector. So we might have, say, Binky here. And if I want to add Brad, we just add it to the vector. Or down here, if we have Smiley, and let's say Luther now hashes, we add Luther to the vector. So with separate chaining, each element 
in the array or vector or hash table is actually a vector and we simply push onto it. Okay, this is the easier technique actually. And Dr. Plank has a implementation Okay, so I'm just going to highlight the important stuff. So first of all, he has a type. So he defines a person class. Okay, and he has, what he's doing, he's storing a person and their credit card number. So CC stands for credit card. And then he defines his type def. So each, what's going to happen is each of his entries in the hash table is going to store a vector of persons. So he's calling that pvec for person vector. So each entry in his hash table is storing a vector of persons. So then here's his hash table right there. It is a vector of pvex. So table is a vector. That's what the first one is. And then each entry is a pvec. Okay, initially they all have empty sizes, but he's going to be pushing his things onto them. And then... His hash function is very simple. There it is. He reads in the names, which you can pursue that on your own because I think you should be able to read that code by now. But once he's read in a person and assigned them to a person uh, class, he then computes the hash value mods it with the table size because the hash value is not going to return a value between zero and table size. It just returns a big random number. So he mods that with the table size and then he simply does a pushback to add that person to the appropriate vector. So that's it. I mean, separate chaining is very simple. Okay, now we haven't talked about the hash function yet. The most difficult part is the hash function, but conceptually it's not at all difficult to do an insert. Yes? You can't do that because there is a limited number of hash table entries and your universe of possible data is much greater than the size of your table. So there's no way that you can write a hash table that's going to handle every possible situation. Think about social security numbers. They're between zero and a billion, essentially. You can't come up with anything that's going to, you have to be able to handle any one of those billion numbers, right? But if your hash table is only 500 entries, there's no way you can come up with a hash function that's going to somehow come up with a unique number for each of those one billion. Right? There has to be duplication. Okay? So that's why you need the collision resolution strategy. You can't guarantee that there will always be unique. You'd like it, and you try to make it more likely by making the table size greater than the number of entry number of pieces of data you'll be putting into it but just like if you choose if I choose 100 random numbers several of them are going to be collisions it's the same thing here you can't 
you can't guarantee uniqueness. So you have to have the collision handling strategy. Okay. And I hope that you could easily do the, well, actually, if you're trying to do a find, so later he does a find operation where a person enters a name and then he's going to find that name. So what he does is he takes the input, which is S, he computes what should be the hash table index for it. Then, because each hash table entry is really a point, is a vector, he needs to search the vector, which is what he's doing there. So what he's doing is he's stepping incrementally through each element of that entry's vector. So here, let's say that the index was 5. Let's say we also had um, Ashley here. So once he has index 5, he has to run through the entries in the vector at entry 5 to figure out whether, let's say, Ashley is on that list or not. Okay? So, that's what he's doing here. So if he finds it, then he assigns to P, he copies the information into the variable P and prints out that information. Okay. And does anyone know what this statement is intended to do right here? So he's found it, and now he sets i equal to table index dot size. He's stopping the loop. Very good. There's no reason to keep going. He's found the item, so he wants to stop the loop. What's the other way he could have stopped the loop? Break. But Dr. Plank hates break, so you won't see break in his code. Feel free to use break in this class. I don't care. I like break, but he hates break, so he stops the loop this way. And then at the end, he checks to see if i is equal to table index dot size, then it's not found. So he knows if he exhausted the vector, got to the end of the vector, it wasn't found. And you might think, well, his code won't work if he just put break in here. But it will. If you put break in there, his code would work equally well. Why would it work equally well? What would I be if I never, if it's never found? If whatever name you're looking for is never found, what will I eventually become? Table size, table index dot size. So eventually you'll get there anyhow and you'll exit. So putting a break there would be just as effective, but he hates it. So that's why you won't see it. Questions? Okay, and deletion would be easy as well. The only thing that you would have to do with deletion is that once you found it, so here, once you found it, you would need to delete it from the vector, which means you would have to figure out how to delete something from a vector. And how would I do that? Vector C++ remove element. I just Google it. And there we go. C++ reference. It looks like it's a race. So you'd look up how that you would use the erase method to erase something from the vector. And I'm not going to go into it. You can look through it yourself, but it will tell you how that you, 
It will tell you how you can remove an element from a vector. Now, it turns out it's pretty uncommon to actually delete things from hash tables. If it was more common, I would spend more time telling you how to do it. But that's why I'm just telling you, you can Google it, and you would simply call the appropriate operation on a vector to remove it from the vector. So we good with separate chaining? OK. So linear probing, we're not going to tell you how to do it since you're doing it in lab. And there's two other techniques that you can use. So linear probing has an issue, which is that linear probing has a drawback. It's called primary clustering. So you tend to get clustering around certain points in your, so you tend to, there tend to be clusters of values. around entries that are frequently hashed to. Okay, or I should say, there tends to be clusters of values around entries where collisions frequently occur. Okay, and this can slow down linear probing because if there's a cluster, it means that, like here, this is a cluster, right? So if you want to insert Brad and Brad hashes to two, you're going to have to do a number of searches to find the empty spot six. So clusters slow down your efficiency. Okay, remember, we're trying to hold the number of searches to about one, and clusters defeat that purpose. So we'd like to try to break up this clustering effect. So a way to break up the clustering effect is to use something called quadratic probing. Okay, by the way, someone at the end of last lecture said, why do you choose the table size to be prime? So last time, unfortunately, Gavin's not here today, and he's my math major. So he was saying, why do you choose often things to be um, prime? Why should, table, why should table size be prime? Okay. It turns out that one reason is that Sometimes your hash functions tend to cluster things like this. Say 4x, 5x. You just get this sometimes. So, for example, if x is 1, there tends to be things that get put at 1, 2, uh, make x 2. Things that tend to be put at 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay, so some hash functions display this behavior. They're less than perfect is what we call them. So what do you think happens if our table size is a nice even number like 10? Where are most of our values going to go? Are we going to get any, well, five, right, into five of them, and specifically which entries are never getting put anything into. The odd numbered entries are empty. Okay, but let's say we make it a prime number. Now they don't, the, now these things don't have a common factor in common with seven because by definition if something is prime it's not factorizable. The problem with ten is that 10 
can be factored into 5 and 2, and unfortunately, x was equal to 2, and that destroyed us. So prime numbers get us more uniform distribution of values when we have bad hash functions. Now, of course, we don't want to use bad hash functions, but if we're using a bad one and it has some predictable sequence like this, prime numbers will alleviate the problem. So that's why one reason why you want it to be prime. Okay, so linear probing actually is not the one that's most commonly used if you're going to use, remember that there's actually the common name for this these set of techniques is called open addressing. So open addressing means that you are storing the values in the hash table. So open addressing means that you store keys directly in the hash table. Whereas separate chaining, you store the keys in vectors associated with each entry in the hash table. So what we're talking about now with linear probing and quadratic probing is techniques that directly store the key in the hash table. Whereas separate chaining, you don't store the key directly in the entry. You instead store it in a vector that is associated with that entry. Is that clear? OK. So quadratic probing is essentially saying that we're going to set our hash values that we check to be, now let's be consistent with what he, Dr. Plank, is doing. So the general strategy is that if the initial collection doesn't work, if the initial hash value doesn't work, so this hash value is our initial value but it doesn't work, it collides, so we need to generate an alternative address. So linear probing just says that we do h of key plus i. So h of zero is equal to, the first place we try is at h of key, this is actually mod the table size. The second one we try is h of key plus 1, mod the table size, and so on. Okay, so this function right here determines what our alternative entries are if there's a collision. And for quadratic probing, we use i squared. So now what's going to happen is that h of 0 is going to be h of key plus 0 squared mod size. h of 1 is going to be h of key plus 1 squared mod table size. h of 2 is going to be h of key plus what? 2 squared mod table size, <coughs> and so on. So let's say that we already have Luther, Binky, and Rosalita in our table, and we want to insert Donatello. 
or D'Antonio, I'm sorry, D'Antonio. So we find that D'Antonio hashes to this number, or the hash key produces that number. Okay, so we add 0 squared, mod it by 10, and we get 1, and we find Luther already occupies our first try. So now we do h1 by adding 1 squared, and that gives us, when we mod it, 2, but unfortunately Binky is there. So now we go and add 2 squared to it, which gives us 31, essentially 31 plus 4 is 35, mod 10 is 5, so D'Antonio goes into location 5 right here. Okay, now let's say we want to insert Frenchy. Okay, and let's say it collides at H. So let's say Frenchy would have matched to 2. That doesn't work right here, but 2 plus 1 squared is equal to 3, and 3 is empty, so Frenchy goes right there. So the advantage of quadratic probing is that it's trying to break up clustering because instead of the um, each alternative entry being located next to each other, it's spreading them out by doing quadratic. So here with 2, we would first search 2 with quadratic probing, then 3, then 2 plus 2 squared is 6, then 2 plus 3 squared mod 10 is 1, 2 plus 4 squared mod 10 is 8, 2 plus 5 squared mod 10 is 7. You can see that we're not checking for alternative locations that are adjacent to one another. They're farther, they're spaced out. So, Quadratic clustering, I'm sorry, quadratic probing breaks up these primary clusters. Now, quadratic probing can have some issues. First of all, it may not check all alternative entries. With linear probing, we were guaranteed that we would search every possible entry in the hash table, but that's not guaranteed with quadratic probing. Okay, so his example is, let's say this is our table right here, and we want to insert peach, and peach has this hash value, and he starts generating this sequence, so 0 squared, 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, and no matter how many times we seem to do it, we seem to be missing stuff. What are some entries that we're never looking at? Two, three, seven, eight. So two, three, seven, and eight we never looked at. So quadratic probing can have an issue that it doesn't look at every entry. Okay. Remember that I said try to choose your table size to be prime? If we choose our table size to be prime, then we are able to assure ourselves that we are able to look at more distinct locations. So there's actually a theorem about that. So if the table size is prime, and it's a number greater than 3, then we can guarantee that the first half of the locations are distinct. So for example, if we choose 11 as our table size, then 11 divided by 2, and these are, have you seen these before, hopefully? It means take the ceiling of that, so it means round up. 
So 11 divided by 2 is 5 and a half. So if you take the ceiling, that gives you 6. So it means that the first six entries are guaranteed to be distinct. Okay, and there's a relatively simple proof of that. Let's say that the table number is prime, and let us say that, so the claim is that for any i and j that are greater than or equal to zero, and that are less than table size divided by two, we claim that h of our key plus i squared mod the table size cannot be equal to h of key plus j squared mod the table size. That's our claim, is that if table size is prime, so if table size is prime and i and j are distinct integers between 0 and table size divided by 2, this is our claim. They can't be equal. Okay, so we use what's called proof by contradiction to prove this fact. So we say, let's assume that there are two integers, i and j, such that they are equal. Okay? So that means that this equality holds. Okay, since h of x is the same in both cases, what it really means is that What it really means is that I, squ I squared mod the table size is equal to J squared mod the table size. So basically, you can subtract H of KX from both sides. That's what I've done in this step right here. So I squared equal J squared mod the table size. So then I subtract them, so I know that that must be equal to 0. Okay, and then I can factor it, which hopefully you're comfortable doing. So that means i minus j times i plus j is equal to 0. And what are the only two ways that this can be true? What's the only way that i minus j, th there's only two ways this can be equal to 0. If i is equal to j, but we've ruled that out. So if i is equal to j, then i minus j is 0. But we ruled that out because we said that i and j is distinct. So the only other way that it can happen is if i plus j mod the table size is equal to 0, which could happen, right? If table size is 11 and i is 5 and j is 6, that would work. But why do we know that i plus j mod the table size cannot be equal to 0? There was a condition that we had that guarantees that i plus j mod table size cannot be equal to 0. It's not just less than table size, it's less than, what did I choose i and j to be? Less than, less than half. I chose i and j to be less than table size divided by 2. If they're both less than table size divided by 2, 
then i plus j must be less than table size, correct? Do we buy into that? Hence, it can't be the case. The only way that i plus j mod table size could be equal to zero is if i plus j could be greater than or equal to the table size. So that's what's called a proof by contradiction because what we've proven is that if this equality held, then one of these two conditions would have to hold, and neither of them can hold. That's called proof by contradiction. So what we've shown is that if this equality is true, that is, if, come on, if I and J yield the same hash table entry, it yields an impossible situation. Hence, it must be the case that for all i and j less than or equal to table, I'm sorry, less than table size divided by 2, that they must hash to distinct locations. So that's another reason why you use prime numbers. Am I going to hold you responsible for this Mathematical derivation on an exam? No, this isn't Math 101. However, as you go through your math, or I'm sorry, your CS curriculum, you are going to have to become familiar and comfortable with proofs like this, and that's why I'm going through them, because you will be held accountable for proofs like this later on in your career. And there's a favorite saying of mine that I learned very early in my career, which is that, um, what is, that repetition is the key to learning. And why is that? Because repetition is the key to learning. So the more time you see these things, the more comfortable you will become with them. You may not be real comfortable with it today. That's fine. But the more times you see things like this, repetition and practice will make you more comfortable with it. So that's why I went through it. Okay, I will not make you regurgitate this proof to me on an exam. But it again shows you why prime numbers are helpful. Okay, because you can prove this theorem, which you could not prove if table size was not prime. Okay, this proof also has an important corollary. Since the first table, so if table size is 11, we know that the first, we've proven in effect that the first six ones we check have to be distinct. What that means is that quadratic probing guarantees Quadratic probing guarantees that if the table size is prime, and the table is less than half full, we will find an empty location for the key. Okay? So if the table is less than half full, it means that, let's take an example. Let's say that 17 is the table size. So if it's less than half full, it means that there are less than or equal to eight items in it, right? Which means how many items, how many entries are free, are empty? Come on, I know you can do simple arithmetic. Nine. So it means there's nine free entries. Okay, and our proof that we showed just guaranteed that the first 
nine entries that we look at will be distinct. That's what that proof was all about. It said it was the ceiling of the table size divided by two. So it guarantees that that many elements, the first number of entries that we look at will be distinct. Well, we're looking at nine entries are guaranteed distinct, and we know there's no more than eight keys in the table, right? So does that guarantee that there has to be an empty, that one of the nine entries will be empty? I guarantee you nine distinct entries that I will look at, and there's only eight keys in the table. One of them has to be empty, right? I guarantee, if I lined up nine boxes here, and I guarantee that you'd look at nine distinct boxes, and there's only eight of them are full, one of them has to be empty, right? That's what I've guaranteed you. So that's why quadratic probing works, at least if the table is less than half full. If the table becomes greater than half full, all bets are off. So the drawbacks of quadratic probing, quadratic probing has two drawbacks. One, it cannot guarantee if the table passes a certain load factor. Exceeds a certain load factor. Then Quadratic probing may not guarantee that you find an empty bucket or that you find even if one exists. So one could exist, but you may not find it. And the load factor equals the number of keys divided by the table size. So the load factor is, between, is a fraction between 0 and 1. So beyond a certain load factor with a prime number, that's beyond 50, a load factor of one half, you may not find an empty entry even if one exists. The second problem is secondary clustering. So just like linear probing had an issue with clustering around the initial collision points, secondary clustering means there may be clusters around second choices. So the first choice is your original hash key. So around the second choice spots. So the second choice spots are any spot that was not your initial spot. So primary clustering refers to clustering around your initial probe. Secondary clustering refers to clustering around any around your second choice probes. Okay, but it's not as bad as linear probing. Okay, if we just quickly look at that. There's a performance comparison
so with L is the load factor here. So you can see that separate chaining, if you do these calculations, separate chaining in general has the best performance, which is why it's so often used. So on average, you only have one search for separate chaining. For a successful search, you only typically have to do one probe to get to the table entry, plus looking at your vector, you're going to have to look at half of the entries in the vector, so it's L divided by 2. For an unsuccessful search, you'll have to look through the entire vector. So let's say your load for separate chaining, you had 200 keys, and your table size was 100. Your load factor would be 2. So on average, each of your vectors would be of length 2. So for an unsuccessful search, you have your initial probe to the entry, and then you have to search the entire vector. Okay. The remaining equations you can't easily derive. You have to use math that's beyond the scope of this course. But the important point is that linear probing has this factor here, which is 1 divided by 1 minus L squared, whereas quadratic probing has this dominant factor of 1 divided by 1 minus L. Okay, and we know that L is less than 1. So as L approaches 1, so as L, so if we look at L going from 0 to 1, which of these factors goes up faster, 1 divided by L or 1 minus 1 divided by 1 minus L squared? This is number of probes. This one goes up faster. You can try it. So try it with L equals 0.9. So if L is 0.9, this first one is 1 over 0.1, which is 10. The second one is 1 over 0.1 squared, which is 1 over 0.01 or 100. So quadratic probing performs much better as L approaches 1. Okay, now, we're not going to cover double hashing until after the exam because I want to spend the rest of this class period on the hash function, something that we've avoided so far. So there is, if the key is an integer, it is very simple, like a social security number. So if the key is an integer, you just mod it by the table size. So if the key is an integer, then your hash function becomes, so if it's an integer, it's easy. You just say that the hash function of key is equal to key mod the table size. That's super easy if it's an integer. The problem is your key is often a string. So you have to map the string to an integer. Okay, A very simple algorithm is to simply add up the ASCII values of your character. So if you have the string Brad, each of these is an ASCII character code between 0 and 127. So you could simply add up the characters in the string, their ASCII values, and return that. 
Okay, so that integer you would then mod with your table size. So these hash functions are always just trying to generate a random number. And then you'll take whatever they return and mod them with the table size. So a very simple and bad solution is to simply add up their ASCII codes. Yes. Yes. In the lecture note, in lecture note, it says um, for the hash value, the integer should be at least as big as the hash table. So what if the That's true. If it's not, you have to do some work. And then my question is, why? I don't think it really says in here, why does the integer need to be at least as big as the hash table? Because if you, um, otherwise the upper entries in the hash table are useless. So you're wasting space. Either just make the hash table equal to the size of the biggest integer, or come up with a better hash function that disperses them. Okay. That's, but that never happens in practice. The, I mean, that never happens where the integer is less than the size of the hash table. So that's a trivial condition that in practice is always fulfilled. So I never will test you on ticky-tack stuff like that. But he's right. I mean for what it's worth. OK, why is this a bad function? Let's say you have the phone book of New York City. So there's 20 million people, and your hash table, you make it to be, say, 30 million. Your hash table size is 30 million. So hash table size is 30 million. What is, and all you're doing is hashing people's names. What's wrong with just adding up their letters and returning that as your random number? Pardon? People could have the same name, but that'll just be a collision to the same thing. We can handle that. We'll just then add in, say, first name. Could be an anagram, but still, it's just colliding to the same. We have collision resolution strategies. That's not the issue here. Number's not big enough. So how big are names likely to be, number of characters? Mine's pretty big, right? Has about 20 characters in it. The biggest ASCII code is 127, and my name has 20 characters. 130 times 20 is 2,600. Is that anywhere close to 30 million? No. So the reason this simple strategy is bad is you're never getting anywhere close often to the size of your hash table. So it's certainly not getting a random distribution of numbers, right? Everything is going to cluster in the first probably 3,000 entries of this table. So that's bad. So then he quickly goes on to better ones. So here's a fairly simple one that is simply saying it's calculating the hash value as for i equals um, 0 to string size, h of i equals 33 times h of i minus 1, exclusive or, that's what that arrow is, s of i. And I believe he sets h of 0, in this case, equal to 5381. It's an arbitrary number that's been chosen to work well. So what happens is 33 times h to the i did they cover bit shifting in 130? Nope. OK. So this less than less than operator, you've seen it before, haven't you, for doing reading? Well, when it's instead in front of an integer, it's no longer a read operation. That's called operator overloading. 
It's now what is called a bit shift operator. What it does is it takes whatever the binary two representation of H is. So let's say H was 13. The binary representation of that is 1, 8, 1, 4, 0, 2s, and 1, 1. So 8 plus 4 plus 1 is 13. So the binary representation of 13 is 1, 1, 0, 1. This says left shift it. Left shift by five zeros. So fill the right side with five zeros. One, two, three, four, five. So it shifts it five bits to the left and fills with five zeros. That's equivalent to multiplying it by 2 to the fifth power or by multiplying it by 32. Okay, if you left shift it, so if you left shift it by 1, so just think about it, if it's just 1, if you left shift it by 1, 0, it's now equal to 2. If you left shift 1 by 2 zeros, it's equal to 4. If you left shift by 3 zeros, it's equal to 8. So basically, what you're doing when you left shift something is that you're multiplying it by 2 to the number of bits that you left shift by, which in this case is 5. It's a very efficient way. It's more efficient than multiplying by 33. And when you're doing hash functions, you want something that is as efficient as absolutely possible. Okay? So then he adds H to it because he already, this thing gives you 32H, 32 times H, plus H gives you 33H. And he did not actually do exclusive or. He did simple arithmetic. Okay, so he really meant to do bitwise exclusive or, but in fact, what he did was arithmetic. So that's his algorithm, though, that he wrote on the website. And when he was done, he returned H. Okay, so if he had done bitwise exclusive OR, I know you covered bitwise exclusive OR in 130 because it's part of the curriculum. So what happens is once he has bit shifted by 5, let's say he did a bitwise OR now. So let's say that this was S of I was a B, and let's say that B was 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. If I do exclu bitwise exclusive or, what is the result of that? What is the result of this? One. What's the result of this? Zero. One. Zero. One. What's the result of this? Zero. Result of this? One. And the result of these? One. So you get that. So what he really meant to do here was take this and use the C operator caret, which is above the 6 on your keyboard. But he didn't. He used plus. But at any rate, should I give you something like this on the exam, I expect you to be able to do it. You've already seen bitwise or, exclusive or, I'm sorry. And shifting, you should be able to do this shift where you shift by it left and fill in the right side with this number of zeros. 
Okay, you can do the midterm based on what I just gave you. So make sure you review it. If you have questions, post it to Piazza. I'll finish this discussion up on um, Tuesday, but suffice it to say that you can now do your lab. You can do lab four. You have enough information to do whatever I will give you on the exam. The ACM hash function we will finish up on Thursday, a week from Thursday, but that ACM function will not be on the exam. Okay? And I will